It's about 6.06. I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Joe Bednar. I'm with the Cambridge Housing Authority. Um, we're here tonight to provide a design update uh, to present plans that went to the city uh, and the planning board under the uh, affordable housing overlay process. Start sharing my screen. I'm screen We'll start translation in a minute, Titi. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't get, I was confused. I was like, it wasn't this before. Sorry. Yeah, we'll introduce it. No problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, before we get started, I just want to give a quick overview of the, the translation features and Zoom that we'll be using tonight. Um, so we have interpretation, um, but also how we'll be taking your comments and, and questions. Um, so if you need interpretation, we have live translations in Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Amharic. Uh, to select the language uh, you channel, you click on the interpretation button uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a PC, it looks like a little globe. Um, if you're using a mobile uh, or web platform, it might be a, in a different location. Um, so if you select that, you'll hear the translator um, over the presenter. Uh, you'll still hear the, the presenter's speech, but it will be much softer um, and you'll hear the simultaneous translation. So we say it in... Um, oh, give me one second. So um, we'll also be using uh, written comments to engage with participants. So please use the chat feature um, to help ease communication. Um, if you prefer to ask questions verbally, um, you don't have to use the chat. Uh, there will be time at the end of the meeting for verbal questions and comments. Um, we ask that people keep their comments or questions to three minutes um, and we will re be reviewing all comments at the end of the meeting uh, from the chat, uh, verbal comments, and uh, we'll encourage all participants who are using the translation also to type their questions or comments in their nat native languages uh, and we'll have our interpreters translate them. Um, and as I said, as you, you can also uh, use a chat or if you prefer, um, you can uh, ask your questions um, verbally at the end of the meeting. Uh, so now I'm gonna introduce uh, our three translators. Um, first, we have uh, Elena, uh, who will be uh, our Spanish interpreter. Um, oh, buenos, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Elena, le va a servir de intérprete. Como dicen, ustedes, do you want me to express this now? Yes. Oh, and, and si ustedes, en, en, para escuchar la, en la presentación en español, pueden ir al, al globo, a, en la parte inferior de de la pantalla, escojan y elijan, ahí pueden elegir el idioma que ustedes prefieren. Este, también hay el, el chat donde ustedes pueden eh, escribir cualquier pregunta o, o cualquier comentario que tengan, lo pueden escribir en español. Uh, siempre va a haber tiempo al final de la presentación para hacer preguntas, uh, que, dejen las pre que, tomen el, eh, que no pasen más de tres minutos entre sus com comentarios y uh, y preguntas al, uh, cuando lleguen al final de la presentación, eso es lo que piden. Uh, pero van a revisar todos los, todos los, los comentarios eh, y todas las preguntas al final. Y, y al, quieren, alentan que todo el mundo participe, si se puede. Entonces, ustedes van a poder escuchar a nosotros, um, interpretar en español, también van a escuchar al presentador a, 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 en la parte de atrás, pero en, en voz baja. Ok. Thank you. Um, uh, Titi, uh, would you mind introducing yourself and, and uh, just briefly explain? Salam. 
Okay. Okay. Salam din nabachachu dana na chwey ani titi neng ke Jefferson Park office ust amasara neng. Ahun sa sisip sa balay yala chum iyak eoch comment kala ba comment kala mas after chila chu elaw damo a nacharasha meeting musial ke jachum ba mau atre number nine ba star na nine ba mangkat iyak e mata ik chila chu mani yon mata iyak e bitha karbu makra mamalasi chila lazilai na ani lara dachum siya tak amat kuten kanya kanya garun Thank you, Titi. I'm done. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, we have uh, Samuel uh, translating uh, Haitian Creole. Nabdi, bonsoir à tout le monde qui a participé dans la réunion de Savin aujourd'hui. C'est toutefois que vous avez besoin de trans et traduction, vous avez besoin de traduction encore là ici. Et si c'est à partir de l'ordinateur courrier, vous avez cliqué sur Globe là. Et vous cliquez sur Globe là, vous avez une traduction en espagnol, en créole et puis en arabe aussi. Et pour choisir créole là ici, vous avez absolument Cliquez sur Créole ici et qu'on soit joué de moi-même qui a traduit pour vous pendant que le présentateur a présenté et a présenté réunion et que moi-même a traduit pour vous et n'a pas gagné. Merci, bienvenue dans la réunion. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to start the interpretation now. So if you need the interpretation, the little globe will pop up and you can go ahead and use it. Okay. So tonight, um, just a brief overview of our presentation. Uh, we're going to go through the project timeline and uh, just kind of recap how we how we got here. We're going to take a look at the site design, review uh, some apartment layouts, review uh, the green space, um, uh, we're going to be looking at reviewing trees, tree preservation, and new tree planting. Uh, sustainability. Um, we're also going to be introducing our contractor, um, Consigli Construction Company, and then last we'll be taking your comments and questions uh, verbally and from the chat. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Clara Freyden, Deputy Director of the Planning and Development Department at the CHA. Thanks, Joe. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. As Joe said, we're going to start with a quick recap of the project's timeline and the comments we've heard thus far. Uh, next slide, Joe. So we started uh, this project in 2016. That's when we hired BWA Architecture to review the existing conditions of the property. Between 2016 and 2019, we held 10 resident meetings on the conversion of JP from public housing to the Section 8 program. That's one of the main funding mechanism for this construction work. We also held meetings on the schematic designs for the project as that developed. Then in the fall of 2020, uh, we secured an allocation of private activity bonds from the state for 2022. And that really uh, identifies a funding path for the project and allows us to set a construction date. And so that restarted the design process, which had been on hold for much of 2022 while we worked on establishing this funding path. But since the end of 2022 and today, we've held over 15 resident meetings on the design and on relocation. Some have been virtual, others have been in person. In addition to these 15 meetings, we've also had many one-on-one -on -one, uh, phone calls and meetings on site with residents to review specific questions and concerns people may have raised. In May of this year, we started relocation to make way for construction. The site will be fully vacant for construction. And so today we have a, less, a little less than 100 households on site. As many of you on this call know, we also held two neighborhood meetings in the spring and one meeting with the North Cambridge Stabilization Committee, which of those of you who aren't familiar, it's a neighborhood group in North Cambridge. And that brings us to tonight, which is our third neighborhood meeting. In less than one month, on November 9th, we will have our uh, design review with the planning board, which is part of the affordable housing overlay process. So this meeting is open to the public. We encourage everyone to join. Again, that's November 9th, uh, and it's 6.30, we're first on the agenda. Uh, after the planning board, we are going to really be focusing on wrapping up the design of Jefferson Park and the construction documents so that in the first quarter of 2022, uh, we can be bidding the project and hiring subcontractors to start construction. So you'll meet Consigli at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation tonight. 
They are a construction manager that's often referred to as the general contractor. They're gonna be leading the bidding process, but most importantly, the construction process. And that brings us to August of 2022, which is when construction is scheduled to begin. When we met last with the neighborhood in April and May, we were anticipating an April 2022 construction start, but we've delayed that a few months to allow more time for the design um, and also relocation. And once construction begins, it's going to last roughly 30, uh, three years, sorry. Um, Joe, next slide, please. So over um, the course of the, of the design process, we've met and heard from over 70 households at JP. That's 60% of the occupied households. And the majority of residents support this revitalization. So here are some quotes on the screen from residents. I'm not gonna read them all, um, but a brief summary of them is that we've heard a lot of positive feedback on the building and open space design from the addition of elevator buildings to the colors and materials that we've selected. People have also expressed a lot of support for the patios and play areas um, and various open space program, which we'll talk about later. There's no doubt that everyone is sad to see many of the trees go, but most residents approve the decision to remove so many trees given the circumstances and support uh, the efforts that the CHA and the design team have made to try to balance trees with parking and more housing. And lastly, we've heard um, a lot of support for adding more affordable apartments on site. Most of our residents acknowledge the need for more housing and feel like this site can absorb more housing. Uh, next, Joe. Thanks. So we also wanted to highlight some areas where what we've heard from residents has directly impacted the site design. So the first uh, is open space. We've heard for a desire for a mix of active spaces. These are like playgrounds and play areas. Also passive spaces, so shaded benches to read a book. Uh, we've also heard a desire for places to gather and private spaces for gardening. So you'll see in this presentation how we've incorporated those comments. We've, all, we've also heard that many residents um, really uh, respect the relationship with the cemetery. It's an important part of the site for them. And so you will see um, how we have worked to uh, preserve this relationship as much as possible by preserving existing trees, narrowing the street we're proposing there as much as possible and widening a green buffer. We also ask residents about the kitchen design. So one of the questions we had was, do people prefer open plan kitchens? These let in a lot of light and air um, from the living area and the dining area, but it means that there is less cabinet space because you don't have a wall um, to provide upper cabinets. The alternative to this is a galley kitchen, which residents have now at JP, which is um, where there's like a full wall and a relatively enclosed kitchen. So no natural light gets into the kitchen, but you do have space for upper and lower cabinets. And we heard overwhelmingly that people wanted an open plan for the kitchen. So you'll see that incorporated in our apartment layouts. A lot of residents also uh, requested more accessible apartments. Um, these are commonly referred to as ADA in the industry, that's American Disabilities Act. Um, and so we, you'll see that we increase the number of ADA apartments beyond what's required by code. Um, we also heard a desire to have ADA apartments access on the ground floor with private entrances. Most accessible apartments that are built these days are off of common corridors and elevator buildings, but there's a desire to have some with individual entrances so we provided those. Um, and there was a lot of comments about eliminating the ramp at the mid-rise, not wanting accessible apartments to have to be accessed by a, a long ramp. So we've incorporated that as well. We also asked residents about their preference between this elevator building versus a walk-up building. Residents, um, well, I should say that elevator buildings are preferred in many cases because they're more accessible. You don't have to walk up stairs, but the downside is you have to share a long corridor with your neighbors. And so there's a sense that they feel less private Whereas walk-up buildings, uh, you're only sharing a common area with maybe one or two other apartments. Uh, we heard, unsurprisingly, a mixture of both. So we've really worked to incorporate that. You'll see that in our massings later on. And then unsurprisingly, there's a request for more bathrooms and more larger apartments and more storage, especially given that we have many families at the site. So you'll see how we incorporated that. Um, next slide, please, Joe. So here are the a summary of the questions and the comments that we've heard from the neighborhood meetings. 
like with the resident comments, we've tried to address most of these throughout tonight's presentations. Please use the chat feature um, or raise your hand at the end of the presentation if, if you have any remaining questions or comments. We heard a lot of concerns about reducing the parking ratio on site. We heard requests to provide electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, we heard concerns about increasing the height on Ringe Ave and what that relationship to Ringe Ave is going to be, especially from the neighbors directly across the street on Ringe. We heard concern about the number of new units we're proposing um, and questions on if we were concentrating poverty in Cambridge. We also heard support for more affordable apartments at JPN in North Cambridge. And then we heard a bunch of questions um, about the construction process. Next, Joe. The majority of the questions and comments that we heard though were about trees. So we've heard a lot of concerns about the number of trees to be removed by the proposed design. We heard a desire to plant more trees on Ringe. Ringe is a relatively narrow sidewalk. There's not that much shade there. And we also heard some questions about how we're going to maintain these trees over time so that they live long, healthy lives. So again, we've tried to incorporate a lot of these questions and comments into the presentation, but, but please use the chat um, if we've missed anything. Next slide, please, Joe. Um, yeah, you can, you can go to the next one. Here, we're gonna highlight um, updates to the site design since we met last spring and share new renderings that we have for the site. So this is the site plan. There are six residential buildings and a maintenance building at the back of the site. There's also a Head Start Early Childhood program on the first floor along Ringe. Here, um, now we have 278 apartments that we're proposing. This is down 10 units from what we were showing in April when we were at 288, but it is an increase of about 103 from the existing. Most of these apartments will be for um, mid to larger families who need two and three bedroom apartments. We've also maintained the parallel parking structure on the roads, um, but we now have 135 parking spaces and a parking ratio of 0 0.49. So this is an increase from where we were at in April. In April, we were at 0 0.45. It's a, by no means a kind of revolutionary increase, but it is an improvement in the right direction. We worked hard to squeeze parking spaces in where we could while still respecting existing trees. Um, this is a decrease from the existing parking ratio, 0 0.59. So for those less familiar with parking ratios, what this means is that we will have one parking space for every two apartments on site after construction. Right now, we have a little bit more than one parking space for every two apartments. We were also able to add um, two electric vehicle charging stations. So those will be at that main intersection. Maybe, Joe, you can show that on the screen, um, at North Street and Main Street the center of the site for residents. None of our residents drive electric vehicles at the moment, but we do anticipate that that's where the, the industry is going. Claire, can you see my mouse? I can, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank I just you. wasn't sure. Um, so next, to just point out some of the big open space features, uh, you can see these large green areas uh, throughout the center of the site and the center of buildings. We'll talk about those a bunch more later on. There's also uh, dark trees here on the plan indicate existing trees to be preserved and the light, uh, lighter green are the new trees to be planted. So you can see that we have five trees along Ringe now. We had uh, four that we were proposing in April that went down at one point to three, then we were able to get it up to five. So we're really trying to shade Ringe as much as possible. We've also been able to move a street around to preserve that one large existing tree that's at the corner of our site in the cemetery. Um, and then in the next series of slides, we're going to get on the ground view. So you'll see an existing view um, of what's there now on the property. And then you'll see a rendering of what we're proposing. So Joe, if Joe, you could show your cursor. The first one is gonna be of building one, kind of on Ringe Ave approaching from Alewife. Yeah, right there. The second one, we're gonna turn down to look Main Street, like turn down the center of this site. Then we're gonna to jump to the back of the site along the cemetery edge um, and look kind of towards our Ringe Ave with the railroad tracks behind us. Um, so next slide, Joe, and we'll, we'll go through those. This is the existing view on Ringe Ave, like we said, coming from Alewife, uh, next. So this is building one. 
It is three stories on a range. It was four previously, but we dropped it down to three uh, to respond to some comments from the butters across the street. It steps back up to four stories um, once you're off of range. There's also an opening across Jackson Street. So that's kind of hard to see on the rendering, but we've included that small black and white image on the lower right hand corner where you can see this pass through more clearly. That is to access the, the playground and the courtyard there, but it's also to help break up this facade, which again was a concern of the abutters directly across the street. The Head Start Early Childhood Program is on that first floor. So you can see how there are those wooden panels there that really differentiate it from uh, the residential above. And then I just wanted to note that we didn't put the five street trees in this rendering because we wanted you to be able to see the building, um, but there, there will be five street trees planted there. Uh, next slide, Joe. This is just an image of a building. It's not the building we're proposing, but it is a building with the same materials so that you could see a little bit more closely the material and the color palette that we're proposing for the facade on Ringe. Um, it's this sand and kind of tan main color with a, with a yellow green or chartreuse uh, accent color, as you can see on these photos. We really like this panel. Um, it's called an Oko skin and it's these smaller panels that are really, they're slightly varied in both color and texture. So it creates a kind of nice, an overall, a nice overall texture to the whole building instead of just a blank facade. It's also much lighter than the darker gray that we used at JP State and we've heard from people that they want something lighter at the entrance. Um, so we think this helps achieve that. Uh, next slide, Joe. Here's the next view. So we're just like a few steps further along range from the last rendering, but we've turned to look into the site. So you can see on the right, that's JP State. Um, and right now these apartments open out right onto a parking lot and face the back of Jefferson Park Federal. Uh, next slide, please. And what we're proposing is that the apartments at JP State and the apartments at JP Fed open out onto a quiet two lane street um, facing each other. It'll be tree lined, as you can see in this rendering. And then you'll have the mostly three stories on JP State mat, um, kind of face the four stories of JP Fed. Next slide. This is the same rendering, it's just we've made the trees transparent so that you can also see how we're trying to vary the materials and the depths of these facades as you move down the streets to break up the building massings. This is a requirement of the affordable housing overlay, but it's also just good design and something that at Steve and the BWA architecture team has employed really successfully at our other projects such as Lincoln Way. I also wanted to point out the warm like wooden apartment entries that you can see, uh, maybe Joe, you can just thank you. So those are the individual apartment entries. Um, we're using a real wood there. And again, that's to try to create like a warm residential entrance. Um, there's, we're also using a masonry block on the first floor to help give a more residential feel and perhaps the uh, metal panels above. Uh, next slide, Joan, thanks. If you've attended our last meetings, you've seen this slide before, but we just wanted to raise it again quickly. This is the Roosevelt Towers modernization from the late 1990s, where we introduced a private road to the center of the site and put parallel parking there and tree lined, you know, put trees on both sides of the streets. We also reoriented all the apartments. So instead of entering off of a parking lot on the center of the buildings, uh, people now enter their apartments from the street. It's been very successful at Roosevelt Towers um, and it's really the same design that we're using at Main Street and we think it's gonna work well at Jefferson Park. Um, wrong way, yeah, there, thank you. So now we are on the Eastern side of the property at the back of the site. Um, as you can see here, there's a mix of private yards in the existing condition. That's what's shown on the left. There's also a shared kind of backyard condition that's shown on the right. So this is the bulk of the usable open space at JP today. It's at the site edges. Uh, and it's certainly a very green space. It's a very cool and relaxing space, but as the main usable open space at the property, we feel it's a shame that it's mostly open to residents on the edge and largely underutilized. And so instead what we're proposing is the next slide. Um, and this is a quiet one lane road with one lane of parallel parking. 
we have narrowed the road as much as possible, as much as the fire department will allow us in order to maximize uh, that green buffer that you see on the right hand side, that's about nine feet wide. We are preserving virtually all, if not all of the existing trees on that side um, of, the, of the property along the cemetery. We also have a new seating area that's just on the right hand side of this rendering um, where the buffer gets much wider. On the other side of the street now on the left hand side of the rendering, you can see a wide sidewalk with plantings um, along the side to create a buffer to the apartments. This is also an elevator building. So you can, um, we can elevate the first floor, which makes it a bit more private from people who are walking along the sidewalk. And it also has these great stoops where people can sit um, you know, in front of their individual apartment entry and enjoy a cool breeze from the cemetery and all those existing trees that will be preserved. Next slide. So here, Joe, if you could just highlight where we just saw the renderings to kind of remind people of the views, that's where we just were, um, at the back of the site and then at the front along the range as well. So here you can see this aerial looking towards the, looking towards the site. We, there's mostly four stories to match the four stories at Brickworks and the three and four stories at JP State. You can also see the three stories at Ringe that steps back up to four. Um, again, there's 278 apartments in this design, and it's a mixture of townhouses and flats. So we talked about how residents wanted a mixture of elevator buildings for increased accessibility, but also some really liked more walk-ups and, and wanted an individual apartment entry. So the kind of typology here is that all of the first floor apartments are townhouses with the exception of some accessible apartment flats that are on the first floor to respond to resident. Um, requests, and then above are flats or secondary townhouses that are accessed by either stairs or elevators. You can see the rooftop solar here that we will be having, um, that we will be installing during the construction project. And then you can also see some views into the open space. Next slide, Joe. Thanks. This really is just to highlight, um, in case any of our Sherman Street neighbors are here tonight, the maintenance building has dropped to one story. It was two before, and it'll be 15 feet tall. Um, and we've also added plantings there as a buffer between the back of this site and, the Sh and Sherman Street. So those were requests that we heard in the last meeting. And then overall, the, this property, the proposed design has an FAL of 1.16. Um, next slide, Joe. So the, the current JP Fed is one of our least dense sites uh, in the CHA's portfolio. It has an FAR of a little less than 0 0.8. So that's 24 unit per acre. And here is a selection of some of CHA's other family sites um, to just show how the density we're proposing at JP Federal compares. You see Jefferson Park State on the upper left, Jackson Gardens on the upper right, Roosevelt Towers, which we just talked about on the lower left, uh, and then Woodrow Wilson Court on the lower right. Next uh, slide. Here we also just wanted to highlight other developments that are not public housing. Some of these are affordable, other are market rate, and all have higher densities than what we're proposing at JP Fed, um, but are successful developments that we feel balance density with open space. So you can see uh, the ones on the upper like the two top ones and on the lower right are all North Cambridge. Um, and then I also think that the bottom left, that's Auburn Court, that's a nice precedent because that is a development that used a similar idea of connecting the, a large site to the street grid to help break up the density of the development and have apartment entries, uh, individual apartment entries that open up onto private tree-lined streets with parallel parking. So again, a similar idea to what we're doing at Jefferson Park. Next slide, thanks. So uh, here we're gonna review typical apartment layouts. Um, as you can see, the average apartment sizes are growing uh, across the board, except for one bedroom apartments, which are shrinking by a little bit more than 40 square feet. All units at JP Federal are going to have central air conditioning. This is really a huge win uh, for the project and for residents. This is something we were not able to achieve at Jefferson Park State. 
Also, almost 50% of the apartments are going to be three or more bedrooms. We also think this is a huge win. Over 2,700 of the households on CHA's local wait list uh, express a need for three or more bedrooms. So that means that there are over 2,700 people who either live or work in Cambridge um, who are in need of affordable housing and need three or more bedrooms so to support their families. So we're really happy that almost 50% of the apartments here can accommodate them. Next. Here's your most typical uh, two bedroom apartment. It's 830 square feet. We have 111 two beds total. They're not all this unit type. This is just the most typical. So as you can see here, the kitchen is employs this open plan. So you can see that the kitchen has one kind of solid black wall, but then also this uh, white outline there, that's an island. And so that's a, to let in the light and air from the window across the living room into the kitchen, like we heard from residents. Um, but then there's still a solid wall through half of the kitchen to get a fridge in there and some extra cabinets. You can also see that there are these two large closets um, outside of the bedrooms, in addition to closets in bedrooms, which is, which is standard and a requirement. Next slide. Here's your typical three bedroom apartment. It's a townhouse, so it's over two floors. Uh, we have 111 three bedrooms. The neatest feature of these, I think, or one of the neatest is that there are windows on both sides. So you, have, you enter in from the front into this vestibule with a coat closet. And then if you wish, you can enter out the back door onto a, a private deck in a courtyard. So that really does mimic the kind of typical Cambridge neighborhood uh, apartment or house. Um, we also have uh, 1.5 baths in all three bedroom apartments. That is more than, than usual in, in public housing and in CHA housing. You have one half bath on the first floor and a full bath on the second. You also have in-unit washer and dryers for all apartments that are in walk-up um, that are in walk-up buildings. So you can see the washer dryer here in the bath, half bath on the first floor. Next uh, slide, yeah, thanks. Uh, here's your most typical four bedroom apartment. We have 14 of these. It's a similar concept. You enter in from the front, you can enter out to the back door if you want. You also have a large kind of vestibule coat room with a closet, open plan kitchen. Um, and then here you have two full baths in all four, four bedrooms, one with a shower on the first floor, second with a bathtub on the second, and a washer dryer in unit as well. Next slide. So the last thing on um, the apartment layouts is to just highlight the improvements in accessibility. So we are improving the amount of accessible apartments right now. There are seven. We're required to have 14 um, by the accessibility code, given the extent of the renovations, and we're providing 17. Multiple of these are on the first floor with direct entrances per the resident request we've already talked about. The rest are scattered throughout the elevator buildings. We want to highlight that the Accessible one bedroom units are decreasing, um, but we do have 21 additional adaptable apartments that can be uh, converted to accessible apartments if needed by future residents of JP. So these adaptable apartments, we have 129 of them in the proposed design, but we have none now. These are apartments that have accessible entrances and also have the clearances required by state and federal accessibility codes to accommodate people in wheelchairs and walkers should an apartment need to be converted from your standard apartment features to ADA apartment features. So there's big improvements here in terms of accessibility for the property. Next slide. So here we're gonna go through um, some of the renderings that we have on the green space. Um, this is the site plan again but just wanted to emphasize some of the open spaces. So the majority of residents are excited about the redevelopment because of the increase in usable open space. We've heard many express their excitement about the parks, as I mentioned earlier, the playgrounds and more spaces to gather. And we certainly agree. Today's um, site is very lush, it's very green, but a lot of these spaces are fragmented and they're not and they're not usable. And so we think that the proposed plan is going to maintain this calm and lush feel while providing much more space that can be used to sit or gather outside. 
So overall, we really feel that adding 100 new apartments um, while being able to increase the usable open space is a win-win for residents and for the neighborhood. Because often when you increase density, you decrease the open space and that's not what's happening here. All right, next slide. So the open space is also designed to support a variety of uses. So you can see here in the blue at buildings two, three, and six, these are these uh, courtyards. Um, they are 8,000 square feet. They're modeled after the courtyards that we have at Lincoln Way and Roosevelt Towers, which are much smaller. Those are around 3,000 or 5,000 square feet by comparison. These are gonna have private decks, um, but then a shared yard. At building one and five in the pink, these are more kind of active areas. They have uh, play areas and lawns. These are 10,000 to 14,000 square feet. And then at building four, you have a large community park, uh, 24,000 square feet. Next slide. So you can just see kind of how uh, this, is this is, whole, is intended to show a little bit more about how we're programming the spaces. So these courtyards are defined by private decks, shared yards, lawns with existing trees and new trees, and then grills and tables. The community park is much larger, lots of trees, benches for passive enjoyment. There'll also be an embankment slide in the center and a circular path for either walking or kids biking. And then again, the play areas which at JP will be defined by a splash pad and then a playground for small children. Next slide. So here's a rendering of the building three courtyard. The building three and the building two courtyard are very similar. Uh, they're over 8,000 square feet. They're for residents and guests of building three only. So that's about 50 apartments, not all 278. They also have these private decks that are designed to be 10 feet deep. So it's deep enough for growing plants and or arranging outdoor furniture, which again was a request from residents. There's also existing mature trees to remain in all of these courtyards to provide immediate shade and then new trees that will be planted in to provide shade over time. And then you can see the shared grills um, and picnic tables as well. The next slide, please. Here's a rendering of the community park at building four. So 24,000 square feet, this is for residents and guests Everyone across the property, not just the people who live at Building 4, has a central lawn. Um, Joe's going to talk about this in a minute, but this really was designed around six existing mature trees to preserve here. And then new trees planted in, as you can see in the rendering. There'll be benches around a circular path, and this um, that's really intended. The circular path is really intended for walking or kids riding their bikes. Right now, kids ride their bikes around Jackson Circle, um, so we think it's going to be very nice for kids to be able to get off of the street and ride their, their bikes in a park instead. Next slide. This is the same rendering, but again, the tree is transparent just so you can see the varied materials and colors. You can also see in the back corner, um, the main entrance to the, uh, ele like to the elevator lobby. It's defined by glazing, so it's kind of separated from um, the rest of, of the entrances. Thank you, Joe. And then this is our last rendering. Um, this is building five, so this is directly across the street from what, the building four park that we were just looking at. This is 10,000 square feet. It's again for all residents and guests, and it's defined by the splash pad. The community room for the site is gonna be open there and it's gonna open out onto the, the park and the splash pad. And then there are also existing mature trees here and new trees uh, will be filled in. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe, who is gonna to talk to um, everybody about uh, a lot of the ways we've been trying to preserve trees and then also our plans to protect, protect trees before, during, and after construction. Thank you, Clara. Okay, so this drawing shows the new site plan overlaid with uh, the survey of existing trees that we had done. So even though public housing remains exempt from the Cambridge Tree Ordinance, we believe in the importance of a strong tree canopy and we're going through what we think are some pretty extreme measures to keep many trees, which we'll detail on the next slides. So the proposed tree loss has led many to ask if the new site plan is worth it. And we strongly believe, yes, it is. We believe yes, because of the need to add affordable apartments in Cambridge, the 21,000 households who are on our wait list, the 6,546 families 
and households who currently live or work in Cambridge or are a veteran who need housing. Um, but we're also increasing the usable green space for our residents with this new site plan. So you've seen this, this uh, again is a landscaping plan showing existing and proposed trees. Existing trees are in dark green, lighter, uh, proposed trees in lighter green. So we're gonna be planting approximately 220 new trees. 194 of these are new uh, deciduous canopy trees. Um, so this is a net gain of 69 trees, 43 of which are, are canopy trees. Um, so the new trees will be mostly canopy or shade trees with a few ornamental trees. They're gonna be planted in denser spacing to maximize canopy size quickly. New trees will be between three and three and a half inches uh, caliper at the time of planting. The size of trees, the largest that's readily available is an optimum size to maximize growth after transplanting. Um, we're also evaluating the neighboring Jefferson Park State Apartments uh, for additional tree planting. Um, this is something uh, we've, we're uh, actively working on. Um, uh, we're working to hire an arborist, uh, which I'll, I'll get to in a second, um, but uh, we're even hoping to get some trees planted uh, at Jefferson Park this fall if it's possible. So these are the steps that CHA staff and our consultants have taken to preserve existing trees at Jefferson Park. All the trees pictured on this slide are going to be preserved. The new design prioritizes preservation of exceptional trees, and that's as defined by the new Cambridge Tree Ordinance as having a diameter of breast height of 30 inches or more. Um, this is the view from the neighboring Catholic Cemetery, and it shows the trees along the site edge. Um, many of these are, uh, seven of these are uh, over 30 inches in diameter. Um, and all seven of these exceptional trees at Jefferson Park are going to be preserved. Uh, the exceptional tree species include tree of heaven, silver maple, honey locust, and a Norway maple. So as Clara mentioned, um, this building four was designed around a group of eight existing trees, uh, six of which can be seen uh, in the uh, photo on the right of the existing development. And typically a building is designed with a consistent elevation uh, for the first floor. So, you know, everything on the ground level um, is, is, at the same, is at the same level. And then if there's any changes in, in, the, in the ground that you're building on, you would adjust that to meet your building. That's typically how it's done. Um, so in this case, uh, regrading you know, changing the, the layout of the existing ground would damage existing trees. So the buildings that we're proposing, many of them had to be stepped to meet the existing grading. So instead of changing the, the site, we're changing the buildings to meet the existing site. And this is done for the sole purpose of preserving existing trees. Um, so you can see here in this image, this is uh, an image of building one, um, like standing along Main Street, looking at building one, and you can see how it kind of gradually slopes down. And then where grading had to be adjusted, retaining walls are gonna be used to protect existing trees. So you can see here on the left of this image, uh, in this rendering, that's an existing tree. Um, and this is a retaining wall uh, whose sole purpose is to protect the roots of this existing tree. Some additional design strategies for preserving existing trees. Um, you can see here along West Street, um, you know, Clara uh, spoke about parking. Um, here we've um, prioritized trees over adding parking. Um, on the left, you can see a diagram showing some stormwater retention and utilities coming down the streets. Um, 
you know, this was done to avoid any existing trees um, and to provide lots of room to plant new trees. Uh, and then as uh, Clara mentioned earlier, um, here along Ringe, building one, these um, front yards here were shortened so that we can move the whole street over away from the cemetery. And that was done to protect this uh, existing tree on Ringe Avenue. Uh, so at the meeting with the North Cambridge Stabilization Committee, um, it was the spring, uh, we were asked to consider relocating large trees. Um, so we uh, hired arborist Carl Cathcart uh, and Matt Fody, a tree relocation specialist. So they were both engaged to identify large canopy trees slated for removal that could be relocated on site during construction. Um, unfortunately, no large canopy trees were found to be healthy enough to be relocated um, for uh, some of the reasons I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, but one of the most important pieces for preserving trees during construction is to have the effort properly coordinated. And all the participants, including the project architects, the landscape architects, civil engineers, and uh, probably most importantly, our contractor, uh, who we're going to meet in a minute, uh, have evaluated and approved the location of these 51 trees to remain to avoid potential conflicts or construction interference. So because the existing trees were not given an optimum environment to grow and thrive, and we have seen the direct impact of that. The CHA is committing to investing in the future tree canopy at Jefferson Park. And you can see you know, an example of this on the you know, picture on the left, um, this tree planted in this uh, tiny little parking uh, space between cars with uh, a granite curb that goes down a couple of feet, completely restricting its roots to this, this small area. And, and as you can see, it died. Um, in the two and a half years since the initial tree survey was completed, 16 large trees have died at Jefferson Park, and over the half of the existing trees on site have a health rating of poor, and it's determined by our arborist. The poor health rating of existing trees at Jefferson Park is due to a variety of factors, including documented insect damage and disease. This is all exacerbated by the stress caused by the urban environment that they were planted in, including limited room for root growth provided by small planting areas and tree wells. The root growth is further limited by soil compaction and heavy clay soil uh, with a perched water table. Um, and recently, climate extremes of heat and water stress have resulted in fungal disease that are plaguing multiple tree species uh, over the last few years that, that everybody's been experiencing. Um, so at this rate of decline and given the health of the remaining trees, in 20 years, an additional 128 trees could be gone. So because the existing trees were not given an optimum environment to grow and thrive, and we have seen the direct impact of that. The CHA is committing to investing in the future tree canopy at Jefferson Park. So we're, as I mentioned, we're working to hire an arborist uh, to start as soon as possible, uh, hopefully within a month, um, to assess the health of the existing trees that are gonna be preserved long before construction is gonna start next August um, to determine what the trees need, um, whether they need to be pruned, fertilized, treated for disease, um, and to start these treatments now. Uh, our team is committed to the added challenges of working around the protected drip lines of trees, uh, stepping buildings to avoid grade changes, despite the added construction costs and complications. Uh, the tree pictured here uh, has been preserved by, on the bottom right, has been preserved by Consigli, our, our contractor at Miller's River, uh, throughout three years of construction uh, on all four sides of the tree. The landscape architects working on this project have prepared a tree maintenance scope 
um, and we will be hiring a specialized firm to care for trees after construction is completed. So this is just an example of um, some of the links that we're going to to provide an optimal environment for these trees um, after they're planted. The street trees will have large planting beds of at least 24 square feet, three feet by eight feet to provide adequate room for root growth. The surrounding pavers have been selected to have the highest amount of permeability available. Um, and then engineered soils under sidewalks um, will allow the roots to actually grow under the sidewalks into surrounding lawns um, and uh, planting areas. So they won't be just constrained to these, these small planting beds. All the trees will be irrigated to reduce the shock from transportation and add resilience during drought and heat extremes. Uh, this is just a, a summary of the existing trees on site. Um, and the diameter of, breast health, uh, diameter of breast height, the diameter of the existing trees, um, and a projection um, showing that within 15 years, with all the new trees that we're planting, um, we will have replaced that uh, diameter of tree. So we know it's gonna take a long time for canopy to regrow, uh, but we're planting in a way to maximize canopy as quickly as possible. Um, so these are projected tree canopies after planting at, um, at planting in 10 years and 20 years. Uh, and we think that these are quite conservative, conservative projections. And they also do not project any growth from existing trees. Um, which will also be increasing. And we think that that's conservative because um, we've seen what has happened at our own site at Roosevelt Towers. Um, this is just one example of our commitment to the environment, cooling and supporting a healthy tree canopy over time. So on the far left, this is 1998. Um, you know, these are new trees planted and you can see uh, and within 10 years, uh, those courtyards are completely full, uh, completely full of tree canopy. And at 20 years, you know, the trees are just completely busting out of the courtyards. Just gonna, gonna quickly review some uh, other resiliency and sustainability aspects of the, the project. So resiliency, this is you know, prioritizing comfort uh, and resident safety. Um, so we are eliminating basement apartments to prevent moisture and mold. Um, that's kind of the impetus for, for doing this redevelopment in the first place. Um, all the units are gonna be built above the 2070, 100 year and 500 year floodplains. You know, that's a concern in, in North Cambridge. Um, we're gonna be providing stormwater control and in, infiltration that's gonna protect against floods. We've relocated all mechanical equipment uh, to roofs out of basements um, to protect against outages, to make the buildings and the site more resilient. Um, as Claire mentioned, we have uh, installed, or we are gonna be installing central air conditioning in all the apartments, um, which is a, uh, not something that we had typically been done, been able to do in our family housing before something we're really excited about, um, and this is to increase the comfort, uh, protection from our warming climate, uh, in increased air quality, interior air quality for our residents. So some sustainability strategies. The new buildings will be Passive House certified. Um, that is a certification that means that the buildings, uh, it's, it's something that's commonly used in Europe. It is a uh, highly insulated, highly sealed building. So the windows won't be leaking. It'll have uh, much more insulation than is required by code. Um, it will have um, high-end triple pane windows. Um, all these things uh, go to the Passive House certification along with high efficiency um, heating and cooling systems. 
Um, the heating and cooling will be all electric to minimize operational carbon. Um, we uh, are also planning to um, planning for future ele complete electrification of the site. Um, uh, so that would be converting domestic hot water to electricity in the future. Um, solar rooftop panels are going to reduce energy consumption. Uh, materials, you know, interior um, materials have been selected to ensure good air quality, low VOC materials. Um, we're reducing the parking ratio. Uh, we're increasing bike parking, bike infrastructure, providing a blue bike station on site. And the buildings will be enterprise green communities, healthy homes certified, um, which is a, a similar certification process to LEED. So JP is part of a significant history of sustainable design at the CHA. The development currently has an Energy Star score of 59 out of 100. The post-construction goal is a score above 90. And the existing development generates uh, over a thousand metric tons of CO2 annually. Post-construction, this is estimated at 530 tons. It's so over a 50% reduction despite adding central AC for all the apartments. This will further be reduced via installation of rooftop solar panels. Um, and the, this emission reduction is equivalent of 214 acres of forest um, or 24,500 trees. This is part of a long history of sustainable projects. Uh, annual energy reductions measured at JP Fed are estimated to be equal to the carbon sequestration of 45,000 trees. So now I'm going to introduce uh, our partners in this. Um, you've met uh, our uh, architecture team, BWA Architecture, um, in the past uh, community meetings. Uh, tonight I'd like to introduce Consigli Construction Company. Uh, we're joined by uh, Bill O'Rourke and Adam Gordon. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, we will keep this brief. I'm sure there are other things you folks want to hear about, but um, I am Bill O'Rourke. I'm a project executive with Consigli Construction. Um, just very quickly about Consigli. Um, we are a fourth generation uh, family owned business. Uh, the current owner's great grandfather started the started the company back in 1905, um, primarily as a masonry contractor based out of Milford, Massachusetts. So um, we are still based out of Milford, Massachusetts. That's our home base, um, but we also have offices now in Boston, New York City, New York State, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, Washington D.C., uh, Portland, Maine, and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So. Uh, we've expanded quite a bit since 1905, but um, we're still still run by the Consigli family. Um, so we just wanted to start with this first slide. I know it's it's there's a lot of this is kind of messy. There's a lot of information here, but um, this just shows 90 plus projects that Consigli has either completed or is currently working on um, in the city of Cambridge. Um, just to give you folks a sense of our, our knowledge of the city. Um, we certainly understand the requirements um, and, and are fully aware and, and conscious of all of the city's ordinances as far as uh, working hours, um, the noise ordinance, ordinances, um, and all those kinds of things. So um, as far as the city of Cambridge goes, we, uh, we implement all of those requirements into every project that we do and, and, and every day on every project. Um, Joe, if you could move on, please. So we just wanted to talk about a few or show you a few examples of some, uh, some of our projects um, that uh, some of our tight urban site projects. Again, we do these all day, every day uh, in Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, New York City, all the other cities that I, that I had mentioned. Um, just uh, actually, Adam, I don't want to steal your thunder here. I know you're going to jump in on some of this stuff. 
Did yeah, I already? No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Um, that's fine. As Bill was saying, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of work in Cambridge, very familiar with doing work in the, the urban dense neighborhoods. Uh, and, and then also, you know, sensitive to, to a butters, you know, as, as was mentioned, you know, we're currently doing a project for CH8 Mills River, uh, which is an occupied building. Uh, so, you know, very sensitive abutters and also adjacent uh, immediately to a daycare. Um, so, you know, for, for the Jackson Place project, you know, we're going to have a comprehensive construction management plan. Um, you know, first and foremost, as, as Joe mentioned, you know, is going to include a, a tree protection plan. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, not, not to, to repeat the things that Joe said, but we're, we're going to be hiring an arborist uh, who's going to come on. Uh, and they're, they're going to, um, uh, you know, implement the uh, protection for the trees before, during, and post construction. Uh, you know, they're going to be there to uh, to monitor, uh, protect, and and care for the trees. Uh, you know, throughout the process. Um, you know, in, in addition, there'll also be a comprehensive traffic management plan, uh, including trucking routes, uh, which will divert uh, traffic away from the neighborhoods. Uh, we also have uh, noise mitigation measures, uh, you know, including strict work hours, um, you know, for deliveries as well as for the uh, construction crews. Um, there'll be a dust uh, and erosion control plan uh, to make sure that, you know, everything stays contained within the site. Um, and then also, you know, visually the, uh, the site will be uh, fenced off with scrim. There'll be safety signage as well as a daily cleanup, uh, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're being good neighbors throughout. Um, I think also vibration up, mitigation, yeah, Adam. Th that's One right. Yeah, yeah uh, the the vibration mitigation, uh, which will also be important. We'll we'll set up uh, you know monitoring points and um, you know make sure that uh, the vibrations um, you know again stay within the site and and um, we protect all the uh, adjacent features. So we will survey adjacent buildings as well. We'll we'll hire a consultant to come in to do that. Just. To, to confirm, um, you know, the existing conditions of buildings. And then as Adam said, we'll have monitors set up on site. We're not, we're not doing any blasting or anything like that. We don't anticipate any rock that we have to break. Um, but obviously there'll be some vibration just with compacting of soils. Um, we do have to demolish the, all of the 13 buildings out on site currently. So um, again, we'll, we'll get an understanding of the condition of all the abutting buildings and then we'll track our progress as we go. And then um, that's how that's mitigated. Joe, could you move on to the next one, please? So these are a couple of examples of, of our current projects with CHA. Adam had mentioned uh, Miller's River. Adam's currently running that project, the one at the picture on the left-hand side. And we are also um, currently renovating the uh, Daniel F. Burns apartments over off of Mass Ave. Um, so the picture on the right, that's Daniel, Daniel F. Burns. Um, that is on Churchill Ave, for those of you familiar with that end of town. Um, that's some temporary protection that we put up that, I think Clara has another slide of the finished product, but we'll get to that. So during the construction, that was phase one of a three phase project. Again, that's Churchill Ave, that's overhead protection um, that we put in place so that we could safely replace the facade. Um, and Matignon High School is just up the street uh, to the left of this picture. And the students came and went all day, every day, uh, back and forth under that protection um, and, also, and then cut across uh, um, right through our, the courtyard of this site. So um, a lot of protection we had to put in place and maintain every day, um, not just for the residents because this is an occupied renovation. Um, but also for the folks in the neighborhood that um, had to egress through our site. Adam, you want to mention what's going on on the, the Miller's one? Joe, if you could just go back real quick. I know you mentioned the daycare, but. Yeah, so, so the, the, the Miller's one uh, was, was adjacent to um, uh, some, some uh, uh, residential properties and then also the, uh, the daycare and uh, restaurant. So, uh, you know, throughout the, the course of the, uh, the demolition of the, uh, uh, what was the existing community center that you see in the picture? Uh, you know, we just monitored, uh, you know, noise and, and vibration levels, uh, you know, throughout to make sure that, um, you know, everything was, uh, was, was under the required level. So, um, and, and that, that operation uh, went, went very well for us. 
Okay, Joe. So these are some current photos, as I mentioned. So on the right-hand side, that's the new facade on phase one of the Burns Apartments. Um, well, not totally complete at that time, but it is now. Um, but you can certainly get a get a flavor for what it looks like now compared to what it what it was before we started the renovation. Yep. And then on the uh, left hand side is the uh, the Miller's uh, River Apartments uh, with the uh, the new facade uh, pictured in the uh, left. Uh, and then the right hand picture is the uh, the quarter of the uh, new community center that we just opened up, uh, which the uh, residents are pretty excited about. So I Thanks, think that's Bill pretty Adam, much yeah, us. Fun. <laughs> hey, thank you, Bill and Adam. All right. You're welcome. So just to highlight again, as we wrap up the next steps on the 9th of November, we have our planning board hearing under the affordable housing overlay. That's at 6.30. It's a virtual meeting. Um, in summer of 2022 is when we anticipate relocation being complete and the site being vacant. Construction will begin in August of 2022. And then, as we mentioned previously, construction will take roughly three years. So it's scheduled to be complete in mid-2025. But we will be building. It's not like all the buildings are demolished and built all at once. Um, buildings will come back over time. So as early as early 2024, we anticipate having buildings ready um, for residents to return to should they wish to return to that building or return while there's still construction going on elsewhere on the site. Um, but by mid-2025, construction will be uh, complete and will be out of North Cambridge. With that, uh, next slide, Joe. We just wanna thank everybody for their time tonight and for all of their questions. We've received a series of questions in the chat. So